Brian Lee with Mitch and Huber again. We're going to start talking about the uh, makeup air and all the fans you got here. Um, we have a couple different types of fans upstairs. We have some inline fans, which I believe are on your exhaust system, which are going to be, they're going to be like more like a round cylinder with the blower wheel internal. You're not going to be able to really see anything. Um, and unfortunately on that, there's going to be usually a couple access doors. Motor will sit on the outside of the fan, and you'll have belts so it'll go from the outside in. I don't know what size we have here. We'll be able to see when we get up on the roof. Um, they're very critical on them ones to watch the inner pulley. You need to be able to reach inside of there every once in a while and tighten set screws. If you don't, that pulley's going to go up or it's going to go down, and you're going to start wearing belts and throwing belts like you've never seen. So, easiest way to get them is to take just to go by you like a four foot piece of straight edge. Don't care what it is, as long as it's straight. Put it on is what you're looking for. Um, when you get into pulleys, um, everybody thinks when you're doing pulleys. So if we have a three groove pulley here and a three groove pulley here, I'll hold this up. So if we have two three groove pulleys on a motor, so we have a motor here and we have a fan here, everybody thinks that they're level. The biggest thing that usually happens on these motors is this one will be cockeyed up on an angle. Okay? And it's what usually causes, and this goes for your pump couplers as well, usually everybody thinks to straighten them side to side, up and down, but you need to look and make sure that you don't have two. So for instance, if this is one and this is one, one will be cocked like this, and one will be dead level. Just because your flat edge hits on one side, you need to make sure, and you can do it with a tape measure, you need to make sure you can hit both sides of one pulley and both sides of the other pulley. Pump couplers and everything when you're lining them. Um, I know he said to use a laser level. I have a laser level. Don't use it. Should have saved our money. <laughs> just bought a couple of straight edges. Um, I honestly feel that if you take a straight edge, then just take your eyes, look at it. If it doesn't look right, it isn't right. So, the other thing you got to look at is if the pump's not mounted level or the fan, I can't let, they're not going to be level. They're going to be, so if you're trying to use like a torpedo level or a four foot level, it's not going to come straight across. It's going, to be, it's going to be lined up, but it might not be level if you're looking for a you know, level bubble. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, something to keep an eye on. But upstairs we have um, several, we have them type of exhaust fans that are the vertical, lower wheels inside, motors on the outside. We're probably going to have a couple of fans that are going to be, they're going to be big, they're going to be square. Motor's going to sit right on the back side. I am guessing we have a couple that are going to be direct drive up there as well. I don't know. The yeah, the bigger ones are direct drive. Big, and the bigger ones are direct drive. drive. And the building relief are also are direct drive. drive. So we're having a lot that are going to be direct drive. One thing you need to check on the direct drive is make sure you check where the motor's bolted down. Check the bolts. Make sure they stay tight. Make sure you check where the prop or the fan blade is attached to the shaft. Make sure you check that. Make sure they're just tight. That consists of nothing but throwing an end wrench on, checking a couple of them, walking away. So. Um, we're going to have uh, belts is one of the biggest things you need to maintain up there. If everything's on VFDs, your belts might go three and four years in between being changed. So the biggest thing to remember when you have VFDs on fans, do not run your belts too tight. They can they can be very loose. Okay, as long as they're not slipping, <coughs> that's really all we care about. They're not flapping in the wind. But if we keep them loose, you're going to maintain your bearings longer. You're not going to have nearly as motor problems, nearly as many motor problems. Okay. Um, I was just out in La Point, out on elementary school. They put a new motor on. Uh, it took two weeks to ruin bearings on a three-inch shaft. When I got out there, you could have put a guitar on the belts, and that was after ruining the the, uh, the bearing and popped up two inches. I I don't have to tighten them that much. So just remember, you can run your belts very loose if they're on frequency drives, so because they're not coming up real fast. I mean, of course you have to, if if they're so loose, you can take them off without even having to try. Probably a little bit too loose. So just use a little bit of common sense on stuff like that. Um, remember, um, I don't care what grease you're going to use on your fans. Just pick a grease and just stick with it. Usually on your, your fan motors and that, um, Mobile makes one called Polyrex EM, which stands for electric motor grease. It's specifically made for it. I believe in here they probably list a shell grease. Um, yeah, right here on page three of this one. They actually recommend, um, they give you a U.S. motor grease, a Chevron grease, mobile, a Texaco, Amico oil grease. So just, just pick a good, um, and you'll notice most of them are number two, which signifies uh, they're just a, what is it, NGLI, I think it is, number two grease. So just pick a decent grease and stick with it. 
Um, maintenance wise, here's your maintenance section on them. They're going to tell you every year they want you to go through every single every single nut, every single bolt, every single greaser. Um, I would tell you on your on your big fans, especially on your supply fans, probably three to four times a year they need to be greased. But on some of your other fans, they're only running periodically. You can probably go twice a year on them. So. You know what I mean? Remember when you're getting ready to grease something, wipe off the end of your grease gun really good, wipe off the zerk before you put any pumps in them. So, and if you've seen grease coming out of it, you put way too many pumps in by that point. So, usually on your grease gun, if you'll pay attention when you're pumping, you'll actually feel the resistance hit when it's full. So, if you go past that, you've blown the seal out, which now introduces any type of contaminant into the bearing. Okay? Pair of the whole uh, science building addition, both the laboratory spaces and the non-laboratory spaces. When we say laboratory spaces, we refer you to systems that are tied on to a laboratory exhaust system. Those rooms don't necessarily have few hoods in them. There's other rooms that are other types of labs that are teaching rooms, prep rooms, and so forth, without few hoods or chemical storage containment units in them that are still being necessary to be a one-screw system. All the supply air that's taken in is exhausted out. The exhaust is brought out through a laboratory exhaust valve. I believe that this building are all from the manufacturer called Phoenix. They operate as a batch and pair with a supply control valve, and they're programmed with a particular offset between supply and exhaust so that there's always more exhaust air being drawn out than supply air introduced. That keeps these designated rooms negatively pressurized with respect to the rest of the building. That difference in airflow is drawn in through cracks in the walls, the gaps under and around the doors, and so forth. The fact that we're serving all the spaces off of a single air handler means this air handler will operate with some return air. Return air is coming out of those spaces that are not served by the laboratory exhaust system. Those rooms have conventional BAB boxes on them. Because of the relatively low temperature of the heating water system on the campus, there are duct mounted reheat coils downstream of the BAB boxes. So all that air that goes into those non-laboratory spaces comes back through the return air path. Some of it works its way into the laboratories to act as makeup air for that difference between supply and exhaust. If you look at the drawings for the building, there is a sheet, and I believe it's MH801, that tallies up all the rooms that are part of the laboratory exhaust system, indicates the design of peak exhaust airflow rate, what the corresponding supply airflow rate would be, tallies up what the offset is, the design offset between supply and exhaust, gives you guys an idea then as to what peak airflow rate should be programmed in and what that offset should be. When you look at that sheet, you'll see that that offset, or the amount that comes in under the door and through the cracks, into the lab spaces, uh, as I believe it's in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 percent of the, uh, uh, the total supply airstream. Supply was based on the thermal loads or the need to provide X number of air exchanges in the room. The exhaust was set to be higher than that. That offset is constant. So if we are exceeding the air exchanges per hour that we need, and we're actually ramping up to meet the thermal loads, as those loads are met, or those loads decrease, and the, and the supply and exhaust back off, that offset stays constant. So it's always going to be the amount that was listed on that sheet MH801. So it makes it pretty straightforward. The advantage to having a single air handler that serves the entire building is that we only have one air handler, one set of controls, and in my opinion, it helps minimize the need for preheating that air that's brought into the building. We're taking a certain amount of return air, mixing it with outside air, and that in turn brings the temperature of the mixed air up. Bear in mind, this is only happening when it's below about 54 degrees outside, so during the cold wintertime months. Uh, that means that the, the mixed air then is treated, heated, cooled, filtered, is 
distributed back into the building. There is no way for air that's introduced into a laboratory space to act as return air coming out of the laboratory so long as the Phoenix system is operating correctly. Because we have that offset, we're always drawing more exhaust out of the room than we're supplying. We've got return, there's no transfers anywhere to allow return air out of that room. That means that these rooms are going to be 100% exhausted and we're not running the risk of getting exhaust air or, or air that should be exhausted through the laboratory system coming back to the return path and back to the air vapor. Each one of the Phoenix exhaust valves has an alarm mechanism on it. If it doesn't register adequate differential pressure across the valve, it generates an alarm, which in effect means, hey, heads up, we're probably not providing design CFM. So when those alarms occur, you want to check into that. The air handler itself here, so being one single large central air handler, is set up with outside air intakes on the north side of the penthouse. The outside air is brought in during, um, I during pretty much all the year, one path for the outside air to take is through some separate control dampers that measure the amount of airflow going through them. It's 100% outside air. And there's an outside air injection fan behind that. This fan is there with filters to pressurize that air and blow it through a heat recovery coil. The heat recovery coil is a runaround setup. The other end of the coil is back in the laboratory exhaust fan plenum. During some times of the year, we don't need that heat recovery so that we don't always have that pressure drop. We have some bypass dampers to go around and allow that outside air to come into the main filter bank. And we basically can back the supply fans off just a touch because we don't have the pressure drop through the heat recovery coils to depend with. To make sure that wasn't a problem, we actually put in this booster outside air fan that's sole purpose is to be there as the provide the additional static pressure to overcome the resistance through those heat recovery coils. Once we've gone through that and the filters, we come to the fans. We have a series of plenum fans in uh, the next position, so it's set up in a more or less blow-through configuration. You'll notice in the fan plenum wall, there are blowout relief doors. If something were to go wrong and the fan were indexed by the control system to go to 60 hertz, and all the fire smoke dampers or all the VAD boxes in the building are closed, these pressure relief doors will pop open due to excessive pressure on them. The pressure relief doors would then allow air from the discharge plenum of the fan to bleed through the plenum wall back to the fan inlet, basically recirculating that air, hopefully minimizing the risk of either the air handler casings being blown out and losing their seal or blowing out ductwork in the rest of the building. After we go through the fans, we come to the preheat coils in the event that we still need some supplemental heat because of the mixture of outside and return air, we uh, have the ability to add some heat. That preheat coil is on a dedicated piping loop that is served by, I believe, 40% propylene glycol. So if there's anything that goes wrong with the controls, we don't want those coils to freeze, we've gone ahead and put the propylene glycol in there. The next coil bank after that would be the indirect cooling coils. Those are served by condenser water that's cooled by the dedicated cooling towers that are out the east end of the penthouse. The intent is that's only used, of course, during the warmer months. If you do so desires, you can drain them down at the end of the cooling season and leave them empty during the winter. If for some reason you forget to do that, we do have basin heaters in the cooling tower basins and the outdoor condenser water piping is all heat traced and insulated. So there shouldn't be any risk of anything actually freezing and breaking. If you do happen to drain everything down, it's a simple question of going and pulling the breakers on the heat trace and of the pump or the, uh, the, the sump heaters to make sure they're not consuming electricity during the winter months. The indirect coils then pre-cool the air. After that, the air goes through the chilled water coils. And I believe the chilled water system, because it's on a closed loop, we also ran that through a heat exchanger and have a, a separate small dedicated loop, I believe also at 40% propylene. 
uh, so that once again we don't run the risk of bursting a coil that is going to be full of water during the winter months. Now, as you go inside the air handler, you'll see that there are coil headers for each of these coil banks. And in the case of the incorrect cooling coils, at the base of those headers, all of them have drain valves with hose fittings. You can drain down the water out of the incorrect coils if you want to. Now, of course, assuming that everything's functioning correctly, those indirect coils should never be exposed to freezing temperatures. But since you're draining down the rest of the system, you do have the ability to drain the water out of the coils as well, just to be safe, so that if something were to go wrong, there is no glycol in that system. It's an open loop. You could empty the coils out and then fully prevent them from being damaged if something were to go haywire with the controls in the meantime. After the indirect coils come the chilled water coils. Those should only be used when we cannot maintain discharge air temperature set light off the air handler. That means 54 degrees throughout the year. To simplify the controls, we are not resetting up the discharge air temperature supply set point off of the air handler. Basically, what this means is it simplifies the operation of cooling mechanism on the air handler. Basically, the cooling sequences go through first an outside air economizer. There is a minimum amount of outside air you can't drop below. Part of that is being dynamically reset because it's also tracking the amount of exhaust air coming out of the laboratory exhaust system. The amount of air coming off the laboratory exhaust system is determined or summarized in two ways. One, the Phoenix control system, which is modulated all the Phoenix laboratory control valves, adds up the exhaust rate out of all the laboratory exhaust valves and gives a combined reading. To back that up, we also have airflow measuring stations of the three laboratory exhaust fans that are at the top of the plenum at the west end of the penthouse. The control system checks those two numbers goes off of and relies on the Phoenix number because it's more accurate. I believe Phoenix states that their control valves the system can give a reading with accuracy of plus minus two percent. The airflow sensors at the fans are probably close to plus minus five percent. However, if the readings vary by more than and it's an adjustable set point, I believe it was about 15 percent, it would generate an alarm give somebody a heads up they may need to go and check the Phoenix system or take a look and see what's going on with the, the fan uh, airflow monitoring systems. That's another reason why we've got this fan that can modulate for outside air injection up front to help modulate that amount of outside air. The way the program is set up right now to keep the building pressurized, and we're also acknowledging that this building is fully open for the concourse, we've asked that the supply air stream into the building always be 10% greater than the exhaust air stream. That's all sort of adjustable set points. So you can tweak that if you find you need to do support and pressurize the building. But just realize you're not just pressurizing this building, you're also pressurizing the rest of the concourse. I would say if you think that the problem is elsewhere on the concourse, try to eliminate that problem before we start trying to bring more air into the science building. The, um, so the cooling mode begins with indirect or with uh, outside air economizer with that dynamic reset for the out minimum outside air. As soon as the outside air is warm enough that we can no longer maintain the discharge air temperature set for the 54 degrees off the air handler, it would uh, the outside air damper should be 100 percent open. The return air damper should be 100 percent closed. The system would then turn on the indirect evaporative cooling coils. It modulates the discharge air temperature off of the air handler to meet that set point by modulating the fan speed at the cooling towers. The system would go through and continue to ramp up the fan speeds up for air temperature increases or as discharge air temperature is not capable of being met. That's really the main control point is discharge air temperature off of the air handler. So if it's not able to meet that set point and the fans on the cooling tower has been ramped up to full, it would turn on the second stage of evaporative cooling, which is to start the direct evaporative air washers. That's the last cooling mechanism in the air handler. There are a series of drain valves, fill valves, blow down valves on the air washer. 
first step is to make sure that the drain valves are closed and would fill the sumps. When the sumps are full, it would start the pumps. And there are float valves that modulate to make up water into the sumps to make sure there's adequate water. The direct evaporative media is on off, and when it's turned on, we want to leave it on for the remainder of the day. So to modulate the discharge air temperature to meet set point, the system would begin to ramp down the fan speed of the cooling towers. Now be aware, there are certain conditions when as soon as they turn on that direct evap, even if the cooling towers are set back to almost minimum fan speed, we may have discharge air that's colder than set point. That's not a problem. In my opinion, we've got decent diffusers throughout the building, especially in the office areas where we have those ground radial diffusers. And we have um, diffusers that are trying to introduce the air with low directional jets into the laboratory spaces. So the VAB boxes, where possible, can back off. Those spaces where we have high air exchange rates, if the temperatures begin to fall below set point, they would begin to read and it seems to me somebody told me that there's not necessarily a problem if we're trying to generate a little bit of hot water load during the summer months because it's another way to get rid of some of the heat off of the condensers on the chillers in the central plant. The direct evaporative air washers have a safety feature built in. There is water detection cable on the floor downstream of the EVAP media that if it detects water, it will generate an alarm and it will close off the fill valve the direct evaporative media, and you guys should come and check that out as quickly as possible. Once both evaporative stages are on, if we're still not able to meet the discharge air temperature set point, meaning discharge air temperature is greater than 54, go ahead and we begin to modulate the flow of chilled water through the coils of the air again. But once again, it's a closed loop with the heat exchanger. So we would modulate the flow of chilled water from the central plant through the heat exchanger, and I believe it's a constant volume pump, a constant speed pump that circulates water through the coils in the air handler. Modulation of the flow on the plant side of the heat exchanger, uh, the ramps up and down and changes the discharge of water temperature uh, on the light bulb side. That's modulated to satisfy discharge or leaving air temperature off the air handler. The, um, the air then goes down central distribution duct work it goes into both lab and non-lab spaces alike. Once again, the lab spaces have their Phoenix valves on the supply side. The non-lab spaces have conventional cooling only VAD boxes and rooms that need heating. They're duct down and reheat coils downstream of the VAD boxes. The laboratory exhaust system also plays into this. All the laboratory exhaust is collected off of central lab exhaust duct work brought up to the penthouse. The fan plenum's at the far west end of the penthouse. It shares a common shaft with the supply duct work in the return. It is ducted all the way up. Once it reaches the penthouse here, you'll find in the fan plenum, there are two parallel paths for this lab exhaust air to take. During the cold months when we want to use heat recovery, the air is brought through a set of filters through the other half of the runaround coils that we talked about that are also serving the front end of the air handler. That air is then drawn to a common plenum after it leaves the heat recovery coils. And there are three laboratory exhaust fans. They're mixed flow fans mounted in the vertical position on top of the lab exhaust fan plenum. And they discharge that air straight up through the roof and there are stainless steel stacks that stick about 10 feet above the roof. They are totally open, there's no rain cap on them. There is a small backdraft damper that's inside that discharge duct just at the outlet of the fan below the roof of the penthouse. But it's internal inside the duct, and it's set up so that if one of those fans dies, it prevents air from short circuiting. You can imagine you have the other two lab exhaust fans running, they could be drawing outside air back through the vertical stack of the fan that just died and into the exhaust button. To prevent that from happening, we have these damper, these spring-loaded backdraft dampers on the discharges of the fans. You guys can get in and do your work on the fans then and don't run the risk of that short circuit taking place. These fans have also been sized so that two fans are capable of meeting the peak ex laboratory exhaust demand for the building. So you should not experience an increase in the total 
amount of exhaust air you're being able to provide out of the building. Only when running two fans. We have three fans so that we can operate them at a lower speed, and if you combine them all up, it's a lower static pressure so that you're actually consuming slightly less brake horsepower, but uh, also less noise because of the lower speed, less chance for vibration. We only ramp them up if one of the fans dies. Same goes for the supply fans inside the air handler. They've been sized to where one fan can fall out. You have redundancy built in, and then the two remaining fans, you've got three fans or four, three. The two remaining fans are capable of ramping up their speed to go ahead and meet the full peak demand CFM that was calculated for the building in the air handler. There's no backdraft damper on the front of the supply fans, but there is a large light off plate inside the fan inlet plenum, and it's hanging there on some studs on the wall. You can take that off, and you'll find in the inlet of any of the fans, all three of them, there are studs poking through that septum that divides the fan inlet side from the fan discharge side. Those blank off plates will slide over those studs. I think there's probably even wing nets to be used to hold it in place. That similarly prevents the fans from short cycling through the fan that's off so that the fans can ramp up and again you can maintain your duct static and keep the demand for air in the building while you guys are working on the fans, getting belts replaced, motors replaced, taking care of whatever the problem is. I think these guys will be able to show you where the blank off plates are. They can also show you where the backdraft damper is on the laboratory exhaust system. Back to the laboratory exhaust system, the uh, the heat recovery coil and associated filters are one of two parallel paths we said that that lab exhaust air can take to reach the fans. There are close-off dampers that uh, can be shut off both upstream and downstream of the combination of filters and coils. And then there's another set of dampers on the second parallel path that was open. This is a bypass, so you can bypass around the heat recovery path. This also allows you to go in and change up the filters that are protecting those heat recovery coils without being exposed to the laboratory exhaust air. Similarly, it allows you to get in and do some work on the coils if need be without being exposed to the laboratory exhaust airstream. Just so you know, the preheat coils in the air handler were sized adequately to handle heat flow conditions with no heat recovery. Most of the time, they should be way oversized. The only time you would find you need their full preheat capacity is if you had to take the, the heat recovery loop offline for maintenance or due to failure. So if you've got enough heat to handle it without the heat recovery, we've got it there though so we're not taking too much heat for this one building and leaving it up to such a plant heat for the buildings on the campus. Um, I think those are the main points. You'll see when you get in, there's a return air path that comes from the shaft and goes along the north wall of the, uh, the air handler plenum to get back to the mixed air entrance. Uh, you'll see where those control dampers are. There's also relief fans along that path. There's simply propeller fans built into the north wall at the west end of the penthouse. They're controlled off of a differential pressure signal, one end of that being outdoors, the other being on level one near the atrium. Now, my assumption is those fans will probably very rarely if ever get turned on. I'm believing or I'm assuming that the air on campus probably bleeds out through all the other buildings. So we'll see, but you do have relief fans in the event that you need them. You guys have probably noticed that the hallways of all three floors are interconnected. The level zero is open onto level one and the big H here going up to level two. Uh, while we technically are calling it an atrium, there is no smoke exhaust system or life safety system there because the code officials allowed the architect to put in some drop down uh, fire rated doors that would close off those openings between level zero and level one of the atrium in the event of a fire. If you guys go back down to the classroom the next time you're down there, you'll see them on level one. All those those openings from level one where you can look into the atrium down at the level zero have those drop down doors on them. So like I said, there's an adequate path for the building to equalize pressure between the floors. But like I'm saying, I think you'll find that very rarely if ever will those relief fans turn on and instead that air is probably going to go out into the other buildings in the concourse. Kind of quick, you guys have any questions on the air handlers or 
Anything in there? Good question. Uh, what about, this is a 24 hour operation or sure. an occupied? The air handler itself is questionable as it's set up for 24 hour operation. Because of the laboratories, they do need to be ventilated 24 7. The company that made the evaporative media, the direct evaporative media, have stated that they need, I believe it's a one or two hour long period every 24 hours where the media is allowed to dry. Now keep in mind, once the media is wet, you need to keep it wet. That's why we don't cycle the direct on and off. When it's on, it stays on for the day. If the building you think is getting too humid, remember it has to have a discharge air temperature of 54 degrees. If you look at the psychometric chart, 54 degrees saturated, you pull that out, sensible heat to 72 degrees, that results in about 50, 54 percent relative humidity. Now, people may sound, may think that sounds a little humid, but anytime you got condensate coming off your chilled water coils, that's what you're getting in your other buildings. A lot of parts of the country, people aren't happy if they can hit 60 percent our age. We're well below that. The time we find people having troubles is if they start allowing that discharge air temperature to creep up above 54, 55 degrees. It's a no-no. You can't do that. It has to stay no higher than, I would say, 55, but try to keep it at 54. Now, the evaporative media, since the manufacturer said they want it to dry down once every 24 hours, we've asked the controls guys to program in a sequence where, I believe it's at midnight or one in the morning, if the EVAP was on, the direct EVAP, it would turn off and go through a dry out cycle. It would only turn on again after that prescribed time period that's in the sequence. During that time, chilled water would be required to meet the loads in the building, but because it's late, and most of the rest of the campus is probably not operating. It should not impact the demand for chilled water on the building in that it's adequate capacity to go around because we're taking it at an awful of time. And as we get into this, it may be possible to talk with the manufacturer and the media and see if they're willing to relax some of those criteria. My opinion is, once the media is wet, it needs to stay wet. I don't understand why they want it to dry out once every 24 hours. But that's what they say, it's their product, and that's what we've got. Any other questions? There are some setbacks on uh, the laboratory ventilation system and the other non-lab spaces. Every room, and maybe you guys have gone through this already, but every room has an occupant sensor. I believe they operate off a combination of infrared, ultrasonic. There are several different mechanisms being used to determine if people are in a given room. Those sensors were put in as part of the lighting control system. Each room has a occupant sensor controller that includes a dry contact that's designated for use by the HVAC control system. The controls contractor is tied into each of those they're using those signals to determine if a given temperature control zone is occupied or not. In the laboratories, pretty much each room is its own temperature control zone. In the non-lab spaces, many of the rooms are one DAV box per room. Some spaces, like the smaller offices, may be two or three rooms per DAV box. In those cases, the control system would control all of those uh, occupant sensors, and they understand which ones are in a temperature control zone. They all indicate that space is not occupied. They index the room back to a standby mode. It's, all, it's not the same as the night setback because we don't want the room to be terribly uncomfortable when somebody comes back in. But it reverts back to a minimum airflow rate and it allows the, uh, the space temperature to float through a bigger dead band. I believe during normal occupied modes, uh, heating's on at 72 and cooling's on at 74, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, the, the larger floating set ones may increase that to uh, be like 6 degrees or 8 degrees instead of only 2 degrees. And so that should help cut back on airflow rate and on energy consumption to rooms when they're not being occupied. During the night time, the laboratories revert back to a minimum air change rate that's in that MH801 sheet we talked about. Uh, the non-occupied space is revert to a full-blown non-occupied where there is no airflow. Uh, I believe there are, I can't remember if we had occupants uh, after hours push buttons on the stats or not, 
it was all worked out with you to you. I know that they got what they'd asked for. We'll have to see if they're on there or not. I, I have to look at the specs and see. But, uh, but most of those rooms that are not laboratory during unoccupied hours, if nobody's in there, uh, there would be zero airflow. Airflow only comes on as necessary to meet the after hour set points, which are, I think, 85 for cooling and 55 for heating. Zero, because once again, the system is set up where it calculates how much air is being exhausted through the laboratory exhaust system, and it, it measures the total airflow rate through the air handler as well as the amount coming through outside air handlers. So you can extrapolate the amount of return air from that. We're supposed to display all that on the control system, and it's been programmed that they have to provide 10% at minimum. 10% more outside air than the exhaust system is exhausting. So the building should always be pressurized. In addition to that, we've got the relief fans. So during the summer months, or any time it's above 54 degrees, this air handler is operating with zero return air, 100% outside air. And it's always going to be providing more outside or more supply air than exhaust air. Because of that, when, this, when I say exhaust air, I mean through the laboratory exhaust system. So because of that, there's always going to be excess air. Is that enough to overpressurize this building? Probably not. It's all open. If it is, you have relief fans that can be turned on. If you find you're having problems where relief fans are turning on and yet the doors are getting sucked open or you feel the building's negative, you can always revamp the set points on those relief fans and that differential pressure set point. So if anything, I'm anticipating this building is actually going to be pushing some air into the rest of the campus, as opposed to drawing air from the rest of the campus. I think it's, if there's any kind of a differential pressure problem, it should help out just a little bit. Now, I said, remember, too, you've got the ability to bring in more outside air than just 10% more than what the exhaust is. You could change that set point 10% to something greater. If you find you've got a localized problem over at DE or Hall of Flags or Sorensen, I'm not really recommending it, but you do have the ability to bump that up. Like I said before, if you have pressure problems on campus, close the holes. Don't pump more outside air in. But if that's not, if that's easier said than done, then I understand you may want to come back here to just uh, address the symptom and not the problem and maybe ramp up the amount of outside air. But once again, this building should be a net pressurizer of the campus. It should never be drawing the campus negative the way that these controls are set up. How many, hours, how many air changes an hour? Per laboratory space? Per the whole building. Boy, I believe the air handler was sized at 100, 160, 176,000 CFM. And like I said, it can go higher than that because of the fan. And that also meant that the face velocities on the coils through the evaporative air washer are conservative, so we don't have problems with carryover. So because of that, you can move even more air if you need to. Uh, the laboratory spaces are all at a minimum of six air changes an hour, and we found that the thermal loads were actually greater than that. So my guess is that most of the building, the air camera can probably provides the units of six air changes an hour for the whole building, even the odd lab spaces. I haven't calculated it, that's just kind of a swag. But uh, at 176,000 CFM plus, that, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys can blow the doors off this place. 